Wonderful. Good. Any slides today? Yeah, I sent them about five minutes ago. You should have them. Okay. Yeah, I, <laughs> Adobe, you don't have them. All right. Figure out why. So, you just Hello, started Yep, they're there. Okay. Good morning. Thank you, Kathy, I assume. Oh, uh, no. No? no? Somebody gave me materials and it wasn't <laughs> Kathy? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I found those. Okay, cool. Um, uh, just as a kind of a follow-up to what you yeah, did last it, week. Meaning you want me to give them out? If, if you like. the same thing. Yeah. If you like. You know, <laughs> it's, it's from Rose Publishing. Uh, All right. They do a lot of charts and little yeah. pamphlets and yeah. um, stuff like that. Sounds great. Thank you. I do have a book I can tell you I'm reading right now. Peter, Peter L. Berger. Okay. Between Fundamentalism and Rationalism. It's really good. Yeah. What he's done, he's, he's actually just the editor of it. He has about a dozen different uh, theologians you know, oh give their opinions on each facet. So did your book. daughter love our game? Uh, of the Christian faith, not and the also one that we went to. Uh, okay. Commentary too. She doesn't like to show off. Trying to find the, the, hot, the sweet spot out. between she fundamentalism and liberalism. Right. right. Well, that was a good video last Sunday. Good. I'm glad. I did it was good. It was a good game. Do you fly out for that? So what is this from? Yeah. yeah. Oh. My first question is: Did so the normal crowd show up? I don't think I everybody call. showed up, but most. What is Michigan like these days? Lot, it's, it's one of the reasons I asked is because I thought. No, no change in that I could see. Uh, it's a lot of road construction. I thought that might be the last time they have to be gone. Is, uh, and that's and that we would just take Thanksgiving Sunday off. It was nice though. No. But. No color changes yet though. Cause I think I will be gone for Thanksgiving, and if people don't want to take that week off, we could do something like what we did last week. And then um, November 5th, Isaiah has a band competition in Reno, and we're not sure we're going, but if we go, I don't know if I ne ne necessarily want to rush back hmm. for church on Sunday. So That's only next month, too. I mean, it's like... Yeah. This is already October. What happened in September? Right. So, for you, coming in and watching that video was, you liked that. That was good. Yeah. Or you just liked that video. It was amazing how somebody that ingrained in Muslim, whatever, Islam, I think, yeah. Yeah. was able to look at his right. own religion with skeptic eyes and come to the conclusion that Mohammed wasn't the guy he thought he was. And uh, that sort of well, took the Hold that thought, because I just realized it's already 9 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and start, and then I actually want to have you repeat that, or I'll repeat it uh, on your behalf. So, Are you going to have to remind me what it was? <laughs> uh, I'll repeat it. It will be good. It will be good. Yeah, that was the hardest part, for sure. When you said that it's a family Yeah, so you're pretty much out of the family. That would be huge. All right, so it's, it's nine. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll, we'll continue this discussion. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity to um, study the incredible things that you have laid out before us, that you have given us a faith in things that are not seen, but not in things that can't be known, that you've given us all kinds of ways to know you and to know the truth that you've laid out before us. But most of all, the importance of your gospel, uh, of the love and grace that you've given us through Jesus on the cross. And we just ask that you help us to understand these things better so that we can share them with other people who need to know about your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we were just debriefing a little bit on last week's um, video. And um, the, um, the video was about Nabil Qureshi, who had converted from 
Islam to Christianity. And you were talking about how amazing it was that he just went from such a, a, a very strident, dogmatic view in his religion to even being open to something else, right? And then after he did the same thing to the Christian religion. Right. He had been essentially a, a Muslim apologist um, by his own profession, had been debunking the faith of other people giving them reasons to doubt, being quite proud of that. And, and I, I actually respect him for that, obviously. If I don't, I'm a hypocrite, right? Um, if you believe something to be true and you believe it has eternal consequences, then I think you ought to be like Nabil, right? I think Christians should be like that. Um, and yet there are, well, I want to come back to the family thing in a second. So one of the things that I usually ask my students is, what is it that actually let, made Nabil open in the first place? His friend. Okay. So there was a relationship between him and David Wood that actually allowed for the basis for that discussion. Yeah. Uh, it's the old people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care angle, right? Yes, David asked him, do you believe in Jesus? And that's what shocked him because no one had ever asked him. Well, that was his her that was his girl. friend in the in in high school had done that. Do you believe in Jesus? Her name was Betsy, right? And she was like, you know, at least you're asking me, whereas everybody else who's not asking me, you know, this is this is a little bit of a conviction for us, right? Uh, Nabil said when he wasn't being asked that by his Christian peers, he concluded that either they didn't care about him or they didn't really believe what they claimed to believe. That, that's a pretty powerful thing to think about uh, and it, because I think most Christians who don't share their faith would say, I'm doing it out of respect. You know, I believe what I believe. I'm not going to push my beliefs on you. And yet here's at least one example of someone who interpreted that as something not respectful at all, but rather, rather hateful, right? And we've we I've paraphrased Penn Jillette a few times from Penn and Teller, right? The whole idea that he has said uh, he's gone online and said, um, you know, if, if you're a Christian and you believe that my eternal salvation is dependent on this Jesus person, how much would you have to hate me to not tell me about it, right? So, um, you know, I, as hard as that is to hear, I think it's important to to process. Uh, I think the other reason why Nabil was open to the discussion is because one of the cool things about Islam for actual practitioners of the religion, you know, Islam has uh, Muslims in name only, just like we have Christians in name only. So there are some who don't really understand even what their own faith teaches, but the ones who do have a value of truth that is really fundamental to the path that Nabil went on. Right, The fact that he recognized that there actually is an objective truth about this that can be studied and known was part of what led down the path. And I think that sometimes we, will, we encounter people that aren't, aren't there, right? They don't believe truth exists, so they don't believe that um, the truth about God can be investigated. And so they're not even willing to have the conversations that Nabil had with David. And so... I think those two things, the relationship and um, the value of truth. And I think when we're having conversations with people about these things, even if their sort of fundamental nature is to not believe in truth, we can pigeonhole them into a situation where they have to confront it. You know, if I say to someone, why don't you believe in Christianity? Often what they're going to say is, well, there's no evidence for it. And instead of saying, well, yes, there is, there's a whole bunch of evidence for it. What I'm first going to do is I'm going to carefully pin you down to your claim that you care about evidence. Because once I've pinned you down to claiming you actually care about evidence, then you're going to have to, you're going to, have to deal with the evidence that I have. Um, but if I just kind of gloss over that real quickly, um, I'm missing an opportunity. I want to be, you like evidence? I love evidence. I am so all about evidence. I think that God has given us all kinds of evidence 
to know him. Uh, I think we're supposed to study it. Um, why is it that you think there's no evidence for Christianity? And if you ever picked up the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, which we mentioned a few times earlier in the year, um, the, the answer uh, that they give in one of their discussions that they give us an example of is, well, I guess nobody ever gave me any, any evidence. Okay, great. Are you willing to have more conversations about that? And remember, you don't need to have a, an encyclopedic knowledge of all this evidence, right? Giving a reason for the hope that is in you, okay, can be as simple as, um, I know there's a God who created the universe, and I know that I've sinned against him, and I know I need his mercy, and I trust in Jesus for his mercy. Now, none of that is evidence in, stated in that form, but I want to point out that what we've been saying all along, right, that saving faith is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's not your job to argue someone into the kingdom, but hopefully the class has taught you that the evidence is out there. The evidence can be found. You can you can take the time to look that look it up or contact somebody like me or you know whatever and say, hey, I was having a conversation with somebody about this. They believe that the universe is eternal, so they're not even open to the idea that God created it. What was that evidence again that we know the universe isn't eternal? And I can shoot you some links or whatever, and so you, you at least know it's out there. Because I think that an unbelieving world believes that, they, they, they believe they believe in evidence, but they often have a lot of beliefs that are very much like religious beliefs, and that's kind of what we've been addressing, okay? All right, so um, in January and February, we gave a 30,000 foot view of um, the science, right? The science that shows that God exists. And I think there's a mountain of that evidence that shows that God exists. Um, and at the time, um, we did not really talk about evolution. Um, and so I went back to the lessons six and seven to see, well, what did I say at the time? And one of the things I said repeatedly was, we will come back to this and talk about evolution. We will come back to this and talk about evolution. So that means that's the next step in our discussion. Uh, I did feel really happy with what was, what was the content of six and seven. So we're actually not really reviewing some of what I thought we'd be doing today. I thought we would be going back over the evidence for um, God uh, that we did cover before. And I am going to mention it here today, but I'm warning you, what I'm about to do is going to go really fast because it is a 100% review. And if you're like, oh yeah, that was interesting. I, I don't remember what we said about that. Then I'm just going to say, go on YouTube and watch lesson six and seven, okay? All right. So we did cover something called the cosmological argument. This isn't advancing. I didn't realize it wasn't advancing. I'll use the mouse. All right. I don't know why it does that sometimes. Sometimes the arrows work and sometimes they don't. Um, okay. So uh, does anybody remember what the cosmological, cosmological argument was even about? What was it? Okay. It's... Um, the idea that everything that begins to exist has a cause, okay? That's just called the law of causality, All right? We spent a whole Sunday on this. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of vaguely remember, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. um, the universe had a beginning, and therefore the universe had a cause. And what we said at the time is that that argument by itself, for a lot of people, points to God, and for a lot of people, it's, eh, Okay, a cause doesn't necessarily mean God. Maybe it's something else, okay? And for, for my class, I don't really, I don't, I don't push really hard on my students that this has to be a proof of God's existence. I think it is very consistent with what we know about God, and that is very interesting. Well, how do we know the universe had a beginning? Do you remember any of that? Do you remember any of the evidences that the universe had a start? It changes. It's constantly going on. You think about a star, and the sun is a big star. It's oh. fire. Yeah, what's it doing? Fire is going to burn out. Burn out. And that's how the, this 
Right. Sun and the stars are going to disappear because they're going to burn out. So if something can burn out, what, what do you automatically know about its beginning? It had to start somewhere. It had one, it had to right? Start. It had a start, right? If, if a star were uh, somehow maintaining uh, a, the same amount of power, showing sort of it, it, eternal power, you would say, okay, well, maybe it didn't have a beginning. It had, it, it's eternal. Well, the, the, that's true of the whole universe. Okay, the universe is actually running out of usable energy. It's not running out of energy because you can't destroy energy, but it's running out of usable energy in the same way that a star is running out of usable energy. Okay, so um, this is one of the things that has led scientists to conclude there was a starting point. Okay, the universe is also expanding. Okay, so. If you just think about that logically, if you were to run the universe backward in time, you get all the way back to a singularity, right? You get back to what scientists for, for decades have said is nothing. It's a, it's a beginning ex nihilo. It's a, it's a beginning from nothing. Now there are debates today about whether nothing is really nothing, okay? And we talked about that a little bit at the time. I'm not gonna go into that today, <coughs> but um, those are pretty easily debunked too, and they're they're really pushed hard by some really snarky, self-important people like Lawrence Krauss, who are you know this is a scientist who's like, well, you're just too stupid to understand that nothing is really something. Like, no, we're you know we're not talking about something. Um, even if you had sort of a, a beginning point that was like quantum fluctuations that s stood there for eternity, you still have a problem of why did we go from that eternal moment to an actual beginning, right? So um, it doesn't really explain away the cosmological argument. And then the biggest one is actually Einstein's theory of general relativity. It's not advancing because I keep using the arrows. Stop using the arrows. Sorry, try to remember to use the mouse. Yeah, you, running out of usable energy, it's expanding Einstein's theory of general relativity. Einstein's theory actually was the first step in all that. And once he uh, made that discovery, other discoveries were made because of that, okay? And at the time, we probably talked about how Einstein didn't love this. Einstein really wanted the universe to be eternal. And there are lots of reasons why someone might want the universe to be eternal. Obviously, if it's not eternal, it seems to point to God, if someone's fighting against that idea, you it seems like they, they seem to be fighting against God. Like otherwise, if you're a scientist, why do you care? Big whoop de doo. It either it's either eternal or it's not. Who cares? If you're gonna fight against the fact that it's got a finite start, then there must be something else going on there. Um, and in my class we talk about actually multiple different reasons why that would be. And again, this is all just review, so I'm gonna keep flying through here. Maybe, I don't know why. Okay, um, what we can know about the cause is this stuff. I actually, one of the things that I don't do in here that um, I'm having, a, I've had a cold all week and I'm having trouble, so much trouble with my nose today. Um, um, one of the things that I do in my class that I can't do in here is I show like the counter evidence, right? So I give the cosmological argument, but then I show them like videos and things of how people claim to debunk the cosmological argument. And the reason why I don't do that in here is because um, of the, the whole YouTube, you know, copyright stuff. Um, but I show them this one video about the cosmological argument. And one of the things that they, they, they talk about in that video is we can't know anything about the cause. But then they go on through their whole video and talk about how the cause wouldn't have time or space or whatever. Like, wait a minute, you, you're admitting we know a lot of things about the cause. And my point would be that these are all things that are consistent with God, right? That they don't prove that it has to be God, but they are, are good evidence of what we know about the cause. Um, the next argument we talked about in February was called the teleological argument. This is the argument from what? Knowledge, I think. Design. Design. 
questions. Okay. Now you can imagine, if you remember any of the specifics from that time, why someone thinks this could be a good argument for God's existence, even if they want to deny God's existence, right? Because the universe looks designed. <laughs> it just has so many elements of fine tuning. Um, although again, it's quoting Lawrence Krauss. Krauss is one who will say, well, if you were designing the universe, you'd make it a lot more hospitable than it is. <laughs> you know, after all, if you leave Earth, you're going to die. It, well, okay. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a terrible argument, but he thinks it's brilliant. Um, the reality is the uniqueness of Earth is actually one of those things that shows us just how fine-tuned things have to be, right? And so these 122 factors, um, and, and by the way, keep telling me if I'm not successfully advancing the slides, but these 122 factors, uh, some of them are universal like, you know, the weight of an electron. And some of them are really unique to Earth. And what people who want to believe that there's life on other planets will say is, well, there's billions of other planets, there must be life somewhere. And these conditions that seem to make life possible on Earth, all we know is that they make life possible on Earth. Maybe life could have evolved to a different set of conditions. Now, what's interesting about that claim, which seems to make some sense, right? Um, what's interesting about that claim is that it really goes outside of what we know in science, right? What we do in science is we say, what do we know? What can we observe? Well, what we're observing is that these conditions that I'm talking about actually are necessary for life. This is why, why scientists will look at a new planet that they've found and say there's an Earth-like planet. <coughs> we call it an Earth-like planet because it has a certain distance from a star, <coughs> looks like it has liquid water. You know, in other words, whenever you see one of these discoveries, they're acknowledging that they think these conditions actually are necessary for life. They're not like, yeah, you know, any planet can have life on it. They don't think that. No, no real scientist thinks that. Um, but laymen often think that way. Um, despite decades and decades of research and experiment, it's, we know this, we know what everybody knows, that life only comes from life. So when we talked about biology, we only talked about two things. We talked about life, just where did life come from, and genetic code. Where does the code come from? DNA. Um, so DNA is, is the code though, that's not where it comes from. Right? It is and it isn't, because what's interesting about DNA is that it's both a physical thing and it's a set of instructions, right? And so, in a sense, the DNA is the physical thing that sort of, it's, it's a little bit like thinking, I've got some blocks, and if I put the blocks together in a certain order, it becomes a message. It's kind of, it kind of works like that to some degree, right? Um, but at that time, we only talked about that. and. Uh, I have students all the time, I should go back, at, well I can't really, I don't know if I can go back a slide, but I have students all the time give me articles, I've told you about this, right, they give me articles, Mr. Grefke, you said life can't come from non-life, here's an article, the headline says, scientists now have evidence for how life came from non-life, and I say, well, read the article, because it usually takes about four paragraphs before you find the article is showing you the article does not say anything about how they found life from non-life. What the article is often, usually, almost always there's a paragraph that says something like this. Scientists now believe that when we discover how life began, it will include X. And the article is about the X, right? It's about some alleged step in the process. Um, the other thing is this idea of code, right? This DNA. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit later about how intelligent design is often called pseudoscience because it can't be tested with you know, scientific method. And yet what's really interesting is that there are so many things in a materialist worldview, right? This idea that we're all just evolved pond scum that are not testable and yet they're still taken as articles of faith, right? So the idea, for example, that genetic code exists, right? 
well, what can we observe about code? We can make all kinds of obser observations about code. And what we know is it always comes from a mind. It's always coming from intelligence. Whenever you have, like, when we have these SETI um, uh, contraptions set up to try to detect noise from outer space, right? They're not just listening for noise, like your dog crashes down the steps kind of noise, right? SETI. Yeah, SETI, S-E-T-I. Okay, if you ever saw the movie Contact, that they start with Search this. For Search for into extra uh, uh, terrestrial light intelligence. Okay, so in the movie, it's just like real life, right? But they, they detect a pattern of noises that they conclude right off the bat that has to be coming from a mind because it's too patterned to be random, right? It's not just knock, 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 knock. It's like the equivalent of Morse code. And after you listen to enough Morse code, you realize, well, wait a minute, that's not just a random set of dots and dashes. There's something going on there. Um, so my point is, we, that's what we know. But we know that information like that, specified information, comes from minds. And so there's every reason to conclude that the, the code in your genetic makeup would also have to have an intelligent origin, and yet there's all kinds of people who deny that. It's like, it's obvious. It's not me just going, oh, I'm too stupid to understand science. <laughs> DNA must be from God. That's not what I'm saying, right? <laughs> what I'm saying is, this is what we know. We can repeat and do all kinds of observations about how intelligence or how information works, and, and it should draw us to the same conclusion when we see that in biology. Well, what I'm talking about there when I, you know, did my funny voice is something called God of the Gaps, right? So if you were watching this video after this class and you were a, a materialist, if you were uh, rejecting God, you believe that science is somehow disproven God, you would look at our 60 minutes here and go, oh, that's all very simplistic thinking. Because the reality is, we are just scratching the surface. So I want to acknowledge that. And I, and I want to um, try to avoid any spots where we literally say, we don't know the answer, it must be God. And yet that's not what we're talking about doing. What we're talking about doing with science is taking this gift from God called science and, and doing the kinds of things that scientists do and drawing the best conclusions from the information that's available to us. Now, Christians are often willing to stop and go, see, there you go. Like with what I said about DNA. I have no problem with a scientist saying, all right, that seems to be true, but we're gonna continue to do experiments anyway and see if we can come up with a different conclusion. Okay, fine, go ahead. I don't think you're ever gonna succeed, but at least be honest about what we know now um, and at the time, we talked about this before, I talked about Neil deGrasse Tyson and how he uses this whole argument. We're not going to go into that today, but um, we mentioned in, in number three this, this whole idea that we just talked about could seem like that whole God of the gaps thing. Uh, and I just want to remind you that that material, I spent 22 hours with my students on that. It's, it's something that we go into in a lot of depth. And I say that only to say, you could go into it more in more depth if you want to. Um, if, and this, this number six here is kind of intended for the atheist watching this video because I now know a couple of them are doing that. Um, don't take what I say in this lesson today as the whole argument. It's, it's a teeny, teeny, tiny slice. But if you wanted to try to debunk some of the things I'm gonna say today, read Signature in the Cell by Stephen Meyer and see what you can do with that. Um, so what we're going to look at today is the things that I promised in February, which is to say, what about evolution itself, macroevolution? Um, and the very first thing I'm going to recommend that you do, if someone asks you, do you believe in evolution, is to ask, like a lot of you are already shaking your head, no, I don't believe in evolution. My, you do whatever you want, but my recommendation is that you ask, what do you mean by evolution? Okay, Because evolution means a lot of different things. 
And quite frankly, if you don't believe in evolution as a word, with all due respect, you're foolish. Like you, as in your person, your personality has evolved, right? If you just understand that evolution is a process of change over time, then of course things change over time. Another way to think about it is microevolution in biology, right? This is change within animal kinds that we can actually observe. This is absolutely is happening. Um, it is a it's a, a a good thing to have some knowledge of. Uh, not a dirty word. Um, I think one of the things that uh, I find is Christians think the Big Bang is a dirty word. And I think there's so much about the Big Bang that just lines up with Genesis that we ought to tread more lightly about that. And I think they think evolution's a dirty word. And rea in reality, if evolution weren't true on some level, nothing would be alive today. Okay, I'm going to talk about that in another second. And then, of course, what usually is meant when somebody says, do you believe in evolution, is that they're asking, do you believe we evolved pond scum, right? Do you, do you believe in molecules to man evolution? Do you believe in the common ancestry of all living things? And what I'm going to be sharing today is some problems with that theory, okay? So as I said, no one denies A or B. In fact, if, if change over time and microevolution weren't true, nothing would be alive. And you could probably figure out what I mean by that, right? So if you thought about an animal and um, it, it's sort of isolated in a particular environment, and then that environment changes radically. Well, it's basically got two choices, doesn't it? Die or adapt. Adapt or survive, right? You know, this is just basic truth. Well, the reality is there are a lot of things built into biology that allow animals to adapt. And if they couldn't, they would die and everything would be dead. That'd be the end of the story. So um, we're not denying those things. Evidence of that in, in that there are species that are extinct, right? That right. Didn't adapt. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And so they became extinct. Yeah, like coyotes now, right? People moved into their territory. They come into my estate and they get the small animals. Mm -hmm. So they still eat, but they're just not eating what they used to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in fact, re referencing all these things that have gone extinct. Um, there is there's some paleontology being done in China where the scientists have said that Darwin's alleged tree actually looks upside down okay so what they're finding is not this grand diversity of life in the upper layers and then working their way back to common ancestry what they're finding is that there's this bizarre plethora of life at the lower levels and as you go up the layers you actually find less and less diversity now we know that new diversity can happen but generally speaking when something dies out it takes genetic information out of the gene pool and so it may not automatically take it out but that's kind of the process right um, it can survive on in recessive genes in other animals but um, it's, you know, if you lose an, an entire animal kind, you're losing that entire animal kind. It's not coming back, you know, outside of Jurassic Park. Um, and uh, what you'll often find, if you look those up, you'll find is that, you know, you'll hear from these Chinese scientists, and they're very open about this. And people who have only heard Western paleontologists and evolutionists talk about this, they're shocked. Like, oh my gosh, how, how have I never heard this before? Well, it should be obvious to you, right? And the, the Chinese scientists say, you know, in our country, you can't talk about politics 
but you can talk about evolution. You can talk. You can say the truth about Darwin. In your country, you can say whatever you want about politics, but you better not question Darwinism, right? And that's that's the reality we live in. That's just what it is. Um, a lot of people think that there are no scientists that actually believe that there are reasons to doubt Darwin. Um, you could look this up, a scientific dissent from Darwinism. This is their whole statement. We are skeptical of the claims of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwin, Darwinian theory should be encouraged. <clears throat> and yet, if you were to go into a public high school today and say, you know what, we're going to teach some scrutiny about Darwin, you'd, you'd be fired. I mean, I would say, based on my research, in at least half of the public schools in the country, you would be fired. It'd be, there are places where you could get away with it, but not, it's not normal. Okay? Um, and um, yet, we're sort of put forth with this idea that there are, there are no problems with Darwin. There's no, there's no reason to doubt common descent, and yet there's actually lots of reasons. I've always thought Darwinism, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever really dug into it that much, but the, the politics of the time and the, the power of the church, Darwinism was basically a response to that. Yeah. No, I think actually a lot has been done about that. Like if you were to look up... Um, the uh, the controversy of the Snopes tri Scopes trial, and um, I think that you you would definitely find that the ways that the church has been overly dogmatic on some things has created a pushback that we kind of brought on ourselves. I feel the same way about abortion, by the way. That the way we have dealt with abortion has led people to push back on the pro-life view in ways that we could have avoided if we had presented the pro-life view in a more compassionate um, logic and science-based approach as opposed to just trying to beat people with a religious view. Um, so you see some of this. Now, uh, of that group of, uh, of over a thousand scientists on that website, the two big things you'll often, like if you go look them up individually, what you'll often find are two big things. One is called the information enigma, and that's just the whole, like where does the genetic information come from kind of thing, okay? So that's, that's a rabbit hole you could dig down into forever. Uh, it's really, really complex, really interesting if you like science. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one is called this, the Cambrian Explosion. The Cambrian explosion is this thing in the, in the, the layers uh, that can be dug up where virtually every body plan that is known in uh, sort of at the phyla level is just there. And you look under there and you think, oh, we're going to find some evolutionary steps up to it. And they're not finding it. And it has led a bunch of scientists to say, like, we have a weird problem here. This is, this is strange. We can make sort of an evolutionary fairy tale up here. No, they wouldn't call it a fairy tale, but they can kind of like make claims about everything above the, the Cambrian explosion because there's enough microevolution going on there that they can claim it to be how, we're, how all the life forms came about. But the Cambrian explosion is actually a much bigger challenge for them. We're not going to go into those two in any detail. I'm going to give you five others. And we'll just see if we have enough time. We'll, as, I, as I got toward the end of this, I started to think, I shouldn't even try to do this in two, one, one class. I should have just spread it out over two. There are a bunch of things that I didn't put in here. We'll see if you even want to spend another Sunday on this. But uh, obstacle number one is the idea that there are molecular machines in your body right now that have dozens of interdependent protein parts, okay? And when a machine needs more than one of these parts to function at all, then you have some questions that should, should pop into your brain. How did this, this machine survive a process of many years of successive changes waiting for all the parts? 
right? Um, if it needed all its parts to function. Like, if it's just sitting there, waiting for all its parts to evolve, now, I'm, I'm being a little facetious, right? Like, no one machine is going to sit there and wait to evolve. I mean, that machine as it exists in the gene pool, right? Um, if it's not functional, evolution is going to weed that out. It's going to eliminate the dead weight in the process. We know that's an observable part of the, the, the process. And then the other question is, the other big question, is where did the new genetic information come from? Okay, so imagine, I'll give you another example in just a second, but imagine this mouse, right? Um, the mouse has a laser, right? Now, th this is way more complicated than what I'm about to say, but I'm gonna give you three parts, right? It has a laser, it has a body, and it has um, this, both on the bottom and on the top, sort of scrolling mechanisms, right? Now, if this were a living thing, you would say, well, in order to be a living computer mouse, it needs all those things, right? If it just had a body, but didn't have any of the functionality, it's sort of this dead thing that should be weeded out by evolution. Well, how many millions of years are you willing to wait around for a new mutation to give us the laser? And then think about how many mutations you need for that laser, but like the laser itself is just a laser. It also needs to be connected to everything else in order for the laser to communicate the information, right? And so in, in this thing that we're calling irreducible complexity, irreducible complexity, that's what we're talking about, that your whole body is made up of these molecular machines that need, not always, by the way, okay? I don't mean every part of every machine. You could imagine uh, a machine that maybe, like before this mouse was a functional mouse, it was a doorstop, okay? And inside the cell, for millions of years, again, I'm not talking about one organism, I'm talking about in the gene pool, in the cell, over millions of years, it functioned in that other way. And then boom, a mutation, and then it had this new function. The problem is, there's, there's so many machines that we have that defy that process. Like, that you could imagine it being true, but you can't demonstrate that it's true. You just have to guess, well, you know, maybe that's how it happened, okay? And there are all kinds of other theories about this. One of them is called scaffolding. And the idea is that maybe over time, this mouse in your cells had this scaffolding, scaffolding that protected it. And that essentially it just got constructed over those millions of years now, I keep saying millions of years. I'd be even willing to say tens of years. Like, speed it up. I, I don't care how many years you need, you still have these same problems, right? And the, the problem is you need genetic information to build the scaffolds, and there's no evidence of the scaffolds, but that's one of the theories, okay? So you could imagine a mouse trap being an example of this, right? So if this were a biological organism, and it had its base, you'd be like, great, Cool, we've got a base, but we don't have a mousetrap, right? And you go, well, you know, we've got the, the hook. Like, even this diagram doesn't even highlight the fact that the whole, like, here's the hold down bar, right? The long thing, yeah. okay? But notice that even if you had a mutation that gave you a hold down bar, you need another mutation to give you the mechanism to hold down the hold down bar, right? And what you need is all of those mutations to work in concert with each other in a way that wouldn't be possible if they're just random. Like they're supposed to be random, right? The information, that the, the, the new generator of information is supposed to be random mutation. <coughs> Keyword, random, okay? And so imagine this is like a bacterial flagellum, which is one of the machines inside of you, okay? and it has a stator 
and a rotor and a propeller. Like it, it, it tools around inside your cells like a little motor boat, okay? Literally, like you, it, you can see this thing fly around. Okay, well, if you don't have all of those things built in just the right spots, and by the way, the genetic information also has to tell the bacterial flagellum not only where to put each of the parts, but when to start and when to stop building the parts, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine uh, a house, right? Imagine the house is one of these molecular machines. It's one thing to have the instruction code to build the foundation. It's another thing for the instruction code to know that the foundation has to be the first thing that gets built, right? And so all of this stuff is just, you know, I, I've, I've investigated what the arguments for this stuff are. Very often um, what you'll see is these big jumps, like this is how it happened. And it really boils down to we're here, aren't we? Now, I'm not suggesting any scientist says that, okay? But even the, the scientific journals that I've read, when you look at their argumentation, what they say is, here's the end result we have. We don't know every step in the process that got us from A to Z, but we know we got from A to Z, and so it's okay for me to kind of surmise the possibility of this step and this step and this step. And they find one step in the process that seems to make sense and then they make a bunch of other leaps. This is actually why when you ask individual scientists to explain the, the whole theory to you, they'll say, well, that's not my area of expertise. And I told you about an example of this in February. Um, I have a cousin who, who's a molecular biologist and he, he was telling me how stupid I was for not believing in evolution. And I said, all right, explain it to me. He said, well, that's not my area of expertise. <laughs> well, how can you say I'm stupid for not believing it? And you're a molecular biologist, and you're telling me. And what he went on to explain is, I know my area. I know that how my area fits in evolutionary theory. And I trust the other scientists who say that their areas also fit the theory. Okay. Um, I, I can't blame that thought process entirely, but you can recognize the, the error, the, the, the holes in that logic. Um, the second obstacle, very similar to irreducible complexity, and if, if you remember, I gave you a giraffe example of this. I, think so. now, I may briefly give it again here, but. Um, so <clears throat> when an animal a certain, needs a certain set of parts to survive, you can call this, irre, uh, not irreducible complexity, non-viability of transitional forms. So I, I wrote out an example of this, okay? Imagine a, an insect evolving an extra set of, let's call it wings, actually. I started with legs and I changed it to wings, but I didn't change all the, the legs to wings, okay? It has two wings, <coughs> sorry, and then it experiences a mutation, and now it's got four wings. Woohoo! Four wings. Four is better than two, right? It's going to be a more. Together. If they work together, right? Now, what's interesting about that is how do you get them to work together? Well, just having the wings isn't enough to solve that problem, right? Um, it needs muscular connections. It needs a certain neurology to make them work, right? Um, these require additional mutations, okay? So if you, if you could then further imagine, okay? Oh, I guess, I, did I get rid of a slide? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I wrote this on your sheet, but imagine the, the bugadoodle, bug doodle, I think I called it, the bug doodle. You're waiting around for evolution to add the parts that you need. You've just got these dead wings, right? The, the wings that don't do anything. Well, in the meantime, the bug doodle has to get other bug doodles to mate with it so that its mutation gets passed down genetically, right? 
Now we actually have seen this. This happens with fruit flies, okay? They use fruit flies to, to simulate evolution because they have a rapid life cycle. And they can tweak the genetics of a fruit fly and get a four-winged fruit fly. The problem is nothing will mate with a four-winged fruit fly because it's a mutant. Poor fruit fly, right? So its genetic information isn't even passed down. And it's got these dead wings that make it not survive as well anyway. Um, you need all these additional mutations, and that's, that's non-viability of transitional forms. Now, the giraffe that I mentioned was, the giraffe has this long neck that's supposed to be this result of this long succession of long-necked animals mating with other long-necked animals, and you eventually get the long-necked giraffe, right? But the giraffe also has a really big heart to pump the blood up its 18 foot body right to its brain now is it ringing a bell a little bit and when it bends over to get a drink of water this really massive heart should basically blow its brains out with blood but it doesn't because it has a valve system in its neck and the valve system shuts down the flow of blood while it gets a drink and you think well that sucks because now it doesn't have any blood getting to its brain and it passes out okay but it doesn't pass out because it's got a little sponge-like organism or organ in the back of its head and it squeezes out some oxygenated blood so that it can continue to thrive while it's getting a drink of water. Well, okay, how many millions of years can that giraffe afford, or giraffes, not one giraffe, right, afford to wait around for the new genetic information to be placed in just the right part of the code to create just the right set of valves and just the right sponge and just the, you know, all those things. The reality is it needs all of them at once. Um, and it, it doesn't get explained very well by a gradual process, even though plenty of people believe it, including scientists who know way more than I do. Now what you'll find is that the animals that have, like show this the most clearly somehow never make their way into science books. Like this is just dodged quite a bit in science books. It's really kind of funny. There are many, 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 many animals like this. Uh, the bombardier beetle, um, the, 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 there's a plover, there's a, the, one of the, like, one of the interesting kind of sub aspects of this would be animal instincts, okay? So let's say you, um, you have this um, turkey-like bird. I'm forgetting what the name is, but it buries its it, <laughs> it it buries its eggs under like this 15-foot mound, and it monitors the mound to keep it a certain um, humidity, a certain temperature. It does this for its whole incubation incubation of the the eggs, and then when the eggs hatch. They have to find their way out of the mound, okay? And then they're not, that, that bird is not nurtured by parents afterwards, okay? But the bird grows up to be able to know how to build the mound, right? And maintain it, right? And do all these other things. And you go, well, how did it know? Where did it learn that, right? And so a subset of this whole non-viability of transitional forms is all of the animals that have that sort of thing about it. Uh, there's another bird that flies from like Alaska to Hawaii. And in order to make it, it has to have a certain amount of body fat in order to make the, the flight. Um, and so they stay in their starting point and then they make the flight once they're ready. And then they, while they're in Alaska, they're, they're giving birth. Okay, and then these other birds, once they're finally mature enough to make the flight, they do it too. Like, how do they know where to go, and and where? How do they know how much fat they need to make the flight, right? And these are things that, of course, you go well. It's just evolution ingrained that into them. Really? Give me the mechanism for that. Don't just tell me evolution, because if you're going to tell me that I'm using God of the gaps to make the statements I'm making here today then you can't do the same thing by just going, evolution did it. Like that, but that's what they do, right? Now again, 
I'm not talking about a scientist with a PhD. They're not going to talk like that. They're not going to be that simplistic about it. But the average person you're going to talk to absolutely believes these things on faith, not on science. Obstacle number three, um, even more fundamental than the things we've been talking about so far, is something called genetic limits, right? So this is, this is like, think about this. Um, my, my phone is coded to be what it is. It's a smartphone, it's a computer, right? Can it be a microwave oven? <laughs> it can't because it has the code to be a smartphone. It does not have the code to be something other than a smartphone. And when, in terms of animals, you have the horse kind, and you have the dog kind, and you have the cat kind, and you have the human kind, you have um, the ape kind, and they have the genetic information to be those things. And there's quite a bit of variability in there, right? Where you can get different horses, but the horse kind will always remain the horse kind because that's the genetic code that horses have. Okay, so that's uh, that's often called genetic limits. Sarah, could you text Jonah? He wants the address to house number two. It's twenty one ninety eight. Mm -hmm. um, Jonah, our our oldest, is in uh, Indiana this weekend, and uh, he's taking his girlfriend past our old houses. So that bird that you were talking about is that a malio? It's not a Malio, but thank you for trying to look it up. <laughs> I don't know why I can't think of it. And normally I, I have all those things because I use them so much in class. I will tell you this if you want to jot this down while I'm thinking about it. Um, on YouTube, you can find something called Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution. Incredible creatures that defy evolution. And there's three of them, three videos. And I will tell you, I'll warn you up front, the host of this, uh, Dr. Job, who used to be a dentist and uh, later went on to do kind of this kind of stuff with science, but um, he presents all of this in a very God of the Gaps way. <laughs> like, look at this hummingbird. Isn't God amazing? And I'm like, yes, I agree with you. It's amazing and God is amazing. But um, just saying it doesn't mean God had to create the hummingbird. Um, but in that those videos, there are a bunch of examples of what I'm talking about. So like the bombardier beetle, in order, the, the, the reason why a bombardier beetle is called a bombardier beetle is because it can actually shoot out of like these twin tail tubes um, a chemical substance, okay? It's very explosive. If you use scientific um, contraptions to kind of measure this, you see it's, it's actually for the size of the, and weight of this bug, it's very, very powerful. And, um, and yet what it's got is actually two chemicals that have to be mixed in order to get the explosion, okay? And so what the bombardier beetle has is all these different parts that make that possible, right? These two different chemicals being generated by two different factories, right? Factories that create the chemicals. Um, they keep them separate, then there's a mechanism to actually put them together. There's the twin tail tubes to do the, the firing, right? And then the, the bug also has some ability to withstand that explosion itself, but use it in a way that's beneficial to itself. And all these, it needs all these things. It needs all these things at once in order to survive. That's another non-viability. Uh, in other words, with genetic limits, even within animal kinds, there are significant limits, even when we're directing a process. So again, I think I might have skipped something on the sheet, but on the sheet, I mentioned mules, right, ligers. So if you take a male donkey, 
And if, by the way, if I did skip something and you need a blank fill, then let me know. Uh, you take a male donkey and a female horse, you can get a, a mule. mule, okay? Can you take a mule and a mule, a male and a female mule, and get more mules? No. Nope. You cannot, okay? Because they have an odd number of chromosomes, they can't, they can't recruit, they can't procreate, okay? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of cool. Uh, same thing would be with ligers and tigons. You can crossbreed uh, uh, tigers and lions, but whether or not you can get offspring from them is impacted by the same kind of thing. In other words, even within animal kinds, even within the cat kind, even within the horse kind, when we're directing the process, we still run into these walls. We still run into these genetic limits, okay? But you're supposed to believe on faith that with enough time, an undirected process somehow jumps over these obstacles, okay? And what I'm arguing here in a very surface way, okay? Just giving you some exposure to the ideas. Um, and again, if, if we were doing this in the way I do it at school, I would say here are some arguments and here are the counter arguments to the things I'm saying today. And I'm not stopping to give you the counter arguments, but um, a counter argument on genetic limits would include something along the lines of a, a, a high emphasis on time, right? The idea is, yeah, you run into those limits in our observation but only because we can't really observe something happening over millions of years, okay? Now I would argue that's just time of the gaps, right? That's just appealing to some big unknown, you know, you don't like God, so you'd rather refer to time as being the solution to all these problems. And yet that's not what they say is they're doing, right? They say they're doing observational science. Uh, I know I labeled two things 21, so we'll call this 20B on the keynote. Um, the next obstacle is predicated on the perception that similar looking animals must be related, right? So the idea is that like, you know, if you ask the average person, and again, I'm not talking about scientists, I'm talking about, you know, the average person, you know, why do you think we're related to chimps? What are they going to say? What's the first thing they'll say? Yeah, we, we, we look similar, right? We have similar... There you go. Okay. And if they know a little bit more, they'll claim we have a lot of genetic similarity to chimps. Um, I love the claim of genetic similarity, though, because it's a fun thing to look up. Like, you share 44% of your genetic information with a banana. Okay. Now, what an evolutionist would say is, well, that's just proof you actually share ancestry with a banana. Not a problem, right? It just sounds, you know, and the fact that we're laughing would make them, make us look like idiots to them, right? <laughs> and yet, um, I would argue there is, there has to be genetic similarity in the food chain in order for the food chain to be the food chain. In other words, if we were completely isolated on a molecular level, you couldn't eat a banana. In order to have that kind of ability to get nutrients from these things, it makes perfect sense that there is some kind of genetic compatibility there. Um, but the idea is, yeah, it's 44% with, with a banana, but it's 98% with chimps, which is a lie, but you'll read it. You could find it 100 times on the internet today, the idea that we have 98% genetic similarity to chimps. It's on the internet, it's true. Yeah. Part of, that, part of that lie is based on the fact that um, it, it eliminates all of what's considered non-coding DNA, okay, sort of like dormant DNA, if you will, in both humans and chimps, and then compares only part of our DNA to then say we share 98%, but they're comparing a small percentage and a small percentage to get the 98% number. People don't know that, you know, they don't put that in the textbook, they just give you the 98% figure. Um, okay, so a part of this is again, anatomical similarity, like this frog looks like this frog, so they must be related, after all, they're cousin frogs, right? 
and genetic information is supposed to be so similar. Well, what happens when you find this frog and this frog? And let's say they have a gut that's very similar, okay? And then we do tests and we find out that the genetic information for the gut of this frog and the genetic information for the gut of this frog are actually different information. It's different code, okay? I'm calling that molecular isolation, that they're actually not showing up as related based on that information. They're showing, showing up as not related based on that information. Now there is a scientific explaining away of this. <coughs> um, I feel like I skipped another slide. Do I have the word convergent evolution on there anywhere? Where do I have it? 22. 22. And for some reason, my presentation skips 22. So the idea here is, uh, like, when I present this to students, they go, oh, I've heard of this. I've heard of this. This is called convergent evolution. No problem, Mr. Grepke. And what they've been taught is that, yeah, you have this snake over here in Australia, and you have this snake over here in Nevada, and they look a lot alike, but they obviously didn't have common ancestry, at least any time recently. Um, they've just evolved to similar environmental pressures, and those similar environmental pressures created the new information, whatever it is, right? Now remember, the new information's gotta come from genetic mutations, okay? You can't just explain all this away with natural selection, which a lot of people would like to do. You can't do that. You need the information. Um, Since I don't have the sheet in front of me, is there something else there I need to address? After all, if you have snakes on two far separated continents, and you're assuming molecules to man evolution, you have to act like it makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's probably the biggest thing, right? Like, even though we have all these examples of molecular isolation, there is this temptation to go, well, of course it works that way. When really you ought to go, wait a minute, that should give you pause. The molecular isolation should make you think, huh, all these other things that convince me that evolution is true, these similar, you know, the, the similar anatomy, right, and the similar genetics, oh, evolution must be true. When those two things then contradict what you believe to be true, you should be able to go, huh, this seems to contradict the theory. You shouldn't go, oh, we were expecting that all along. That's just moving the goalposts, right? And yet, that's, that's what's happened with that. 23, it should be noted, um, it's very popular to call intelligent design, which is the umbrella over all of this, right? So if you go back to the fine tuning argument, if you go to where did genetic code come from, how did life begin, and then all of this um, the obstacles to evolution um, and you look it up and you go oh that's called intelligent design and then you look it up online you'll see it's called pseudoscience 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 like science being or, or, or you know sort of fairy tales being made up or dressed up like science well most of the time what they'll claim is that intelligent design is not testable we can't do science this way. That's why we're calling it pseudoscience. And yet, I've, I'm showing you lots of examples today of the kinds of things that are believed in the evolutionary theory that are still huge mysteries, right? The things that make the, the scientists I mentioned before say, yeah, we just don't think mutation and random, random mutation and natural selection can, can solve all these problems. And yet, the way it's presented to us in the public, right, in science textbooks in high schools and colleges, uh, online, on TV, the way it's presented to us is that there are no problems with the theory. All these things make perfect sense, right? And all I'm really trying to show you is that there's 
there's a bunch of holes. It's occurred to me that uh, if we ever get to the point where we can debunk evolution, I mean, you know, globally, uh, then, you know, it's really holding back science, hanging on to a theory like that. I mean, we'd have an explosion of discoveries. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, one of the things I would like to talk about if we get that far is like, what are the what's the what are the pitfalls of this? And that's one of them. You know, when I was in high school, I had the science class. I never ever was told anything about Darwinism. Really? Evolution. I mean, this with all due respect, you've been around a while. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't quite. It, it hadn't quite taken hold then okay. the way that, the way that it has so today. I was lucky then. I did. Well, I yes. Was yeah. Just because I graduated from high school in 1954. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the exact dates of the Scopes trial, but in your lifetime, this has gone from being illegal to teach Darwinism to illegal to contradict Darwin. Mm -hmm. in, you know, in your lifetime. Okay. Yeah. So I'm glad I'm as old as I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, this this last thing we're talking about. Okay, um, and again, I don't know if I skipped something, but I'm going to look to see if I skipped something. Okay, so I say this is a myth, um, but what's most outrageous about this is how many evolutionary things hinge on um, things that contradict observations. I'm going to give you an example of this for the last um, obstacle. Um, if you learned anything ever about Darwin, you might have heard of this animal. What animal did he make famous? Finches. The finches. Okay, yeah. Darwin's finches. Yes. Okay, and the idea is that he found these finches, and there were the, the, there was this trend in beak sizes. Okay, so there was this um, change in the environment that led to certain food sources not being available. The finches that were kind of predisposed to needing a certain kind of food source were uh, dying out. And the ones that were more predisposed to handle a tougher seed were surviving and then mating with each other. And the sort of net change over time was about a 5% size change in these beak sizes. You go, great, wonderful. In fact, I have a video that I show students where a very pro-evolutionary uh, scientist says, this, this, here I'm thinking it's five till, and it's actually 10 after. I'm so sorry. Um, this guy says, this was happening not only fast enough for evolution to be true, but he says something like, as much as 10 times faster, you know, or I don't know what he said, it was some outrageous number. And um, the reality is what they do, what they did is they oscillated back. Like if you went back and, t and checked the same finch population today, you would find that this, con this trend goes back and forth, okay? So what our actual observation has shown is cyclical change, right? That when you look out into the actual uh, natural world, these kinds of changes happen all the time where you'll have a set of conditions leads to a certain a set of a subset of the population kind of ends up dominating and then usually the conditions change again and things kind of shift back again that's the norm and um, again that's the observational evidence and what's presented to you is something that contradicts the observational evidence I totally lost track of time but we're we're gonna we're gonna end right there, and then after we we end to end, I'll ask you what what you want to do next. Let's pray, dear Heavenly Father. We thank you for this day. We thank you again for everything that you've given to us, especially your grace through Jesus. In His name, we pray. Amen.